Personal History of David Copperfield by Charles Dickens. In language whose excess imparts the power they feel so well, there may perhaps in such a scene some Part three, Miss Betsy Trotwood. Of days that have as happy been, and you remember me. I set out to find my Aunt Betsy Trotwood, taking very little more out of the world towards her than I had brought into it on the night when my arrival gave her so much umbrage. I had no money, and so faced the necessity of walking all the way to Dover, where Peggotty had once told me my aunt lived. Excuse me? What is it you want? Can you tell me where Miss Trotwood lives? My mistress? What do you want with her? To speak to her. If you please. To beg of her, you mean? No. Well, you can follow me to her house if you like. I followed her to a very neat little cottage with a small square garden in front of it, full of flowers. Once there, my aunt's maid hurried into the house as if to shake me off. I stood at the garden gate, suddenly conscious how like a street urchin I must look. I was on the point of creeping off when a lady wearing gardening gloves, stalked out of the cottage and began to dig in her garden. If you please, uh, ma'am. Go away! No boys here! If you please, aunt. Uh, hey? If you please, aunt, I'm your nephew. Oh, Lord! I'm David Copperfield of Blunderstone in Suffolk. We came the night I was born. I've been very unhappy since my dear mamma died. I've been taught nothing and put to work not fit for me. And I've walked all the way and never slept in a bed since I began the journey. Lord, Lord, <laughs> save us. <coughs> you, you better come in. <coughs> Here, drink this. <coughs> Oh, mercy on us. <coughs> Mr. Dick! <coughs> Miss Trotwood? Uh, uh, Dick! Now, don't be a fool, Mr. Dick, for nobody can be more discreet than you can when you choose. You've heard me mention David Copperfield. Oh, oh, David Copperfield? Now, don't pretend not to have a memory, because you and I know better. David Copperfield? Yes. D- D- David Copperfield... Oh, yes, to be sure, t- t- certainly. Well, this is his boy, his son. Indeed. <laughs> He'd be as like his father as it's possible to be if he wasn't so like his mother, too. Oh, David's son, I- 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 indeed. Yes, he's run away. Now, his sister Betsy Trotwood would never have run away. <gasps> well, y- you think she wouldn't? Oh, she'd have lived with her godmother, and we should have been devoted to one another, eh? Oh, yes, indeed. <laughs> Where in the name of wonder should his sister Betsy Trotwood have run from? Or to? Why? Why? Nowhere. (laughs) Well then, how can you pretend to be wool-gathering when you're as sharp as a surgeon's lancet? (laughs) Now, here you see young David Copperfield. (laughs) Young David Copperfield? Yes, yes. And the question I put to you is, what shall I do with him? (laughs) What what shall you do with him? (sighs) Do with him? Yes! Come, I want some very sound advice. Why, if I was you, I, I should... Yes? I should... I should wash him. <sighs> Janet! <laughs> yes, ma'am? Mr Dick sets us all right. <laughs> Heat the bath. Yes, ma'am. 
<laughs> now, Mr. Dick, I want your advice. Oh, Janet! Donkeys! Oh, yes, Mum! Off with you! Go on now! Go! Who says? I say so! You know right here! Off or I'll fetch the police! Go on! Off! Ow! Oh. I'll show my mother, I you will! Get on with you! All right, all right, we're going! Two saddle donkeys had presumed to set hoof on a little piece of green in front of the cottage. To this day, I don't know whether my aunt had any lawful right of way over that patch of green, but she had settled in her own mind that she had. The one great outrage of her life, demanding to be constantly avenged, was the passage of a donkey over that immaculate spot. After dinner, a roast fowl and a pudding, my aunt asked me to tell my story. When I'd finished, she heaved an indignant sigh. <sighs> Whatever possessed that poor unfortunate baby that she must go and get married again, I can't conceive. <laughs> Perhaps she fell in love with her second husband. <laughs> fell in love, Mr. Dick? What business had she to do that? P perhaps she did it for pleasure. <laughs> pleasure indeed? Yes. A mighty pleasure for the poor baby to fix her simple faith on any dog of a fellow certain to ill-use her. <sighs> what was she thinking of, I should like to know? She'd had one husband? Yes. Ah, she'd seen David Copperfield out of the world, who was always running after wax dolls from his cradle... She'd got a baby. Oh. There were a pair of babies when she gave birth to this child sitting here. Oh. What more did she want? Oh. What indeed? <sighs> she couldn't even have a baby like anybody else. No. No. Where was this child's sister, Betsy Trotwood? Well, where hey? indeed? Ah, yes. That little man of a doctor, Jellip, or whatever his name was, all he could say was, it's a boy. A boy. Oh, yeah. Oh. Oh. Imbeciles, all of them. And then she goes and marries a murderer. <gasps> or a man with a name like it. And that woman with the pagan name, that Peggotty. She goes and gets married next. I hope he's one of those poker husbands we read about in the newspapers and will beat her well. Oh, no. Huh? Please, Aunt Betsy, don't talk of Peggotty like that. She is the best, the most devoted friend I have in the world. Oh. She loves me dearly. She loved my mother dearly. And my mother died in her arms. She told me her home was my home. And I would have gone to her, but I was afraid I might bring trouble upon her. Oh, well, well. <coughs> the child is right to stand by those who have stood by him. <laughs> there. Uh, Mr. Dick, uh, I want to ask you another question. Look at this child. <laughs> David's son. Exactly so. <laughs> what would you do with him now? Do with David's son? Mm -hmm. With David's son? <laughs> yes. Uh, just do with... Yes. <laughs> I should put him to bed. <laughs> Mr. Dick sets us right again. <laughs> Janet, is the boy's bed ready? All was ready. The room was a pleasant one, overlooking the sea. I remember I prayed that I never might be homeless any more, and never might forget the homeless. Then I looked at the moonlight on the water, making a shining path and seemed to float away along that path into the world of dreams. Next morning at breakfast, I felt very anxious to know what my aunt proposed to do about me. I've written to your stepfather. I've sent him a letter I'll trouble him to attend to, or he and I will fall out. Does he know where I am? I've told him. Shall I be given up to him? I can't say, I'm sure. We shall see. Would you go upstairs and give my compliments to Mr. Dick and ask him how he gets on with his memorial? Uh, David, I suppose you think Mr. Dick a short name? I thought it was rather a short name yesterday. Uh, you're not to suppose he hasn't got a longer name if he chose to use it. Mr. Richard Babley. That's the gentleman's true name, but don't you call him by it whatever you do. No? No, he can't bear his name. That's a peculiarity of his. Not much of a peculiarity, for he's been ill-used enough by some that bear it to have a mortal antipathy for it. So make sure, child, you don't call him anything but Mr. Dick. Mr. Dick? Ha! Ah, Phoebus, oh, how does the world go? <laughs> oh, I'll tell you what. I, I shouldn't wish it to be mentioned, but it's a mad world. <laughs> mad as Bedlam, boy! 
<laughs> My aunt sends her compliments, <laughs> sir, and asks how you're getting on with your memorial. Well, I, I believe I've made a start. I think I've made a start. Ah, you've been to school? Yes, sir. For a short time. Do you recollect the date when King Charles I had his head cut off? I think it was the year 1649. Hmm. So the books say. But I, I don't see how that can be. If it was so long ago, how could the people about him have made the mistake of putting some of the trouble out of his head after it was cut off into mine? Into yours, sir? Yes. It's very strange that I, I can never get that quite clear. Mm. But no matter. No matter. <laughs> ah, my compliments to Miss Trotwood. I, I'm getting on very well indeed. Ah. Look there. Ah, what do you think of that for a kite? <laughs> it's beautiful. <laughs> it's taller than a man. I made it. We'll go and fly it together, you and I. It's covered with writing. <laughs> is... is that something about King Charles's head? Oh, yes. There's plenty of string, and when it flies high, it takes the facts a long way. That's my manner of diffusing them. I don't know where they may come down. It's according to circumstance and the wind and so forth. But I take my chance of that. <laughs> Well, child, and how is Mr Dick this morning? He sends his compliments and says he's getting on very well indeed. Hmm. What do you think of him? He... he seems a very nice gentleman. Oh, come! Your sister, Betsy Trotwood, would have told me directly what she thought of anyone. Be as like your sister as you can and speak out. Is he... is Mr Dick? I ask because I don't know, aunt. Is he at all out of his mind? Not a morsel! Oh. If there's anything in the world Mr Dick is not, it's that. Indeed. He has been called mad. I have a selfish pleasure in saying he's been called mad, or I shouldn't have had the benefit of his society and advice for these last ten years and upwards. In fact, ever since your sister Betsy Trotwood disappointed me. So long as that. And nice people they were who had the audacity to call him mad. If it hadn't been for me, his own brother would have had him shut up for life. Oh, no. Yes, because Mr. Dick was a little eccentric, though not half so eccentric as a good many people, his brother didn't like to have him visible about the house and sent him away to some private asylum place. So I stepped in and told him, your brother's sane, a great deal more sane than you. Let him have his little income and come and live with me. I'm not proud. I'm ready to take care of him and won't ill-treat him as some people have done. And so, after a deal of squabbling, I got him. And he's been here ever since. He's the friendliest creature in existence. And as for advice, <laughs> nobody knows what that man's mind is except myself. Indeed. Did he say anything to you about King Charles's head? Yes, Aunt. Well, now, he had a fever, and he connects his illness with disturbance and agitation, naturally. And King Charles is the figure he chooses to use. And why shouldn't he? Oh, certainly. I'm aware that it's not a business-like way of speaking, so I've insisted that there's not a word about it in the memorial. Is it a memorial about his own history? Yes, child. He's memorialising the Lord Chancellor, or the Lord somebody or other, about his affairs. And if he likes to fly a kite sometimes, what of that? Well, Franklin used to fly a kite. It keeps him employed. I say again... Nobody except myself knows what that man's mind is. I waited very anxiously for Mr. Murdstone's reply to my aunt's letter. When it came, I was terrified to find that he was coming to speak to her the very next day. Nothing happened till late in the afternoon. I was sitting in a state of dread while Mr. Dick paced the room anxiously and my aunt sat sewing by the window. <sighs> Janet! Donkeys! You're trespassing! How dare you! Aunt, it's... Go along, you bold-faced thing! Aunt, it's Miss Murdstone. Eh? And that's Mr Murdstone walking up behind her. Oh, I don't care who it is. You. I won't allow it. With you. Go away! <gasps> Janet, turn that animal round. Lead him off. Oh, it's a donkey boy again. The red-haired one. I'll teach him. My aunt rushed out, 
pounced on the donkey boy and oh. dragged him into the garden, oh, you hear me, boy? calling on Janet to fetch the, Janet, fetch the police. But the young rascal oh. escaped and went whooping off, taking his donkey with him, Miss Murdstone having now dismounted. My aunt, a little ruffled by the contest, stalked past her visitors into the house and took no notice of their presence till they were announced. Mr. and Miss Murdstone. Good day. Shall I go away, Aunt? No, certainly not. Ah, I was not aware at first to whom I had the pleasure of objecting, but I don't allow anybody to ride on that turf. I make no exceptions. Your regulation is rather awkward to strangers. Is it? Miss Trotwood. I beg your pardon. You are the Mr. Murdstone who married the widow of my late nephew, David Copperfield of Blunderstone Rookery. Though why Rookery, I don't know. I am. You'll excuse my saying, sir, that I think it would have been a much happier and better thing if you'd left that poor child alone. I so far agree with Miss Trotwood in that I consider our late lamented Clara to have been in all essential respects a mere child. It's a comfort to you and me, ma'am, who are getting on in life and not likely to be made unhappy by our personal attractions, that nobody can say the same of us. No doubt. And it certainly might have been a better and happier thing for my brother if he had never entered into such a marriage. I have always been of that opinion. <laughs> I'm sure you have. <laughs> uh, now, allow me to introduce you to Mr. Dick. <laughs> Dick? <laughs> Mr. Dick is an old and intimate friend on whose judgment I rely. Good afternoon, sir. <laughs> Good afternoon. <laughs> Miss Trotwood, on the receipt of your letter, I considered it an act of greater justice to myself and more respect to you, <laughs> Thank you. to answer it in person, however inconvenient to me, rather than by letter. This unhappy boy who has run away from his friends and his occupation... And whose appearance is perfectly scandalous and disgraceful. Jane Murdston, have the goodness not to interrupt me. This unhappy boy has been the occasion of much domestic trouble and uneasiness, both during the lifetime of my late dear wife and since. He has a sullen, rebellious spirit, a violent temper, and an intractable disposition. <sighs> My sister and I have tried to correct his vices, but ineffectually, and we both felt that it is right that you should receive this assurance from our own lips. It is hardly necessary for me to confirm anything stated by my brother, but of all the boys in the world, I believe this is the worst boy. Strong! Not too strong for the fact. Ah, well, sir? I have my own opinions as to the best mode of bringing him up. Opinions founded partly on my knowledge of him and partly on my knowledge of my own means and resources. I am responsible for them to myself. I act upon them and I say no more about them. It is enough that I place the boy under the eye of a friend of mine in a respectable business, mm. that it doesn't please him, that he runs away from it, makes himself a common vagabond about the country and comes here in rags to appeal to you. I wish to set before you the consequences of your abetting him. About your respectable business... First, I suppose if he'd been your own boy, you'd have put him to that just the same? If he had been my brother's own boy, his character would have been altogether different. Or if that poor child, his mother, had been alive, he'd still have gone into that respectable business of yours? Clara would have disputed nothing my sister and I agreed was for the best. <laughs> Unfortunate baby. <sighs> My nephew, I believe, left her an annuity. It died with her? It died with her. And there was no settlement of the little property, the so-called rookery, on her boy? Her first husband left it to her unconditionally. Good Lord, man! Of course it was left to her unconditionally! I can't see David Copperfield looking forward to any condition of any sort. But when she married you, when she took that most disastrous step... Did no one put in a word for the boy? My late wife loved her second husband and trusted him implicitly. Your late wife, sir, was a most unworldly, most unhappy, most unfortunate baby. And now what have you to say next? Merely this. I'm here to take David back unconditionally. Ah. To dispose of him as I think proper and to deal with him as I think right. I'm not here to make any promises or give any pledges to anybody. I must caution you that if you abet this boy once, you abet him for good and all. If you step in between him and me now, you must step in Miss Trotwood forever. I am here... 
for the first and last time to take him away. Is he ready to go? Oh. If he isn't, and you tell me he isn't, on any pretext, no matter what, my doors are shut against him forever. And yours, I take it for granted, are open to him. Hmm. Well, Mum, have you anything to remark? All I could say has been so well said and so plainly stated by my brother that I have nothing to add, except my thanks for your great politeness. <laughs> and what does the boy say? Hmm? Are you ready to go, David? No, Aunt. Please don't let me go. Please, for my father's sake, protect me. <sighs> Mr. Dick, what shall I do with this child? Well, I, I, Mr. Dick? Uh, <laughs> have him measured for a suit of clothes. <laughs> Mr. Dick, your common sense is invaluable. Sir, you can go when you like. I'll take my chance with a boy. If he's all you say, at least I can do as much for him as you've done. But I don't believe a word of it. Miss Trotwood, if you were a gentleman... Oh, stuff and I... nonsense! How exquisitely polite. Do you think I don't know what kind of life you must have led that poor unhappy baby? Do you think I don't know what a woeful day it was for the soft little creature when you first came in her way, smirking and making great eyes at her? I never heard anything so eloquent. Oh, yes, bless us. Who so smooth and silky as Mr. Murdstone at first? He worshipped her. He doted on her boy. He was to be another father to him. <laughs> Get along with you, do! I never heard anything like this person in my life. And when you'd made sure of the poor little fool, you began to break her like a poor caged bird and wear her life away, teaching her to sing your notes. This is either insanity or intoxication. Mr. Murdstone, you broke her heart. She was a loving baby, loving baby... And through the best part of her weakness, you gave her the wounds she died of. That's the truth, however you like it. You and your instruments may make the most of it. Allow me to inquire whom you're pleased to call my brother's instruments. Ah, it was clear enough to me before you ever saw her that the poor soft little thing would marry somebody at some time or other. But I did hope it wouldn't be as bad as it's turned out. That was the time she gave birth to this boy here. To the poor child you sometimes tormented her through afterwards. Yes! <laughs> That's a disagreeable remembrance, isn't it? And makes the sight of him odious now. You needn't wince. I know it's true without that. Good day to you, sir. And goodbye. Good riddance to you too, ma'am. Ah, let me see you ride a donkey over my green again. And as sure as you have a head on your shoulders, I'll knock your bonnet off and tread on it! Oh, thank you. Thank you, Aunt. Oh, <laughs> splendid. <laughs> Quite <laughs> splendid. <laughs> Mr. Dick, you'll consider yourself guardian jointly with me of this child. I shall be delighted to be the guardian of David's son. Oh, very good. <laughs> That's settled. I've been thinking that I might call him Trotwood. Oh, oh certainly. Certainly. David's son's... Trotwood. <laughs> oh, to be sure. Trotwood Copperfield. <laughs> In a few weeks, my aunt had taken so kindly to me that she shortened my adopted name to Trot and even encouraged me to hope that in time I might rank equal in her affections with her lost goddaughter, my imaginary sister, Betsy Trotwood. <sighs> Well, Mr. Dick? Oh, dear. I think I've won. Oh. Now, Trot. Yes, Aunt? We must not forget your education. Would you like to go to school in Canterbury? It's near at hand. Then I should like it very much. Good. Should you like to go tomorrow? Yes. Very good. I'll come and see you, and I'll make a special kite for you, Trotwood. Oh, thank you, Mr. Dick. <laughs> yes, ma'am? Uh, Janet... Hire the grey pony and chase tomorrow morning at ten o'clock. 
and pack up Master Trotwood's clothes. He's going to school. Well, are you happy, Trot? Very happy indeed. Thank you, Aunt. Good boy. Is it a large school? Why, I don't know. We're going to Mr Wickfield's first. Does he keep a school? No, Trot. He keeps an office. It's just here. Whoa, boy! <sighs> Good afternoon, Miss Trotwood. Good afternoon, Uriah Heap. Is Mr Wickfield at home? Mr Wickfield is at home, ma'am. Please to walk in there. Uh, I can manage, thank you. Miss Betsy Trotwood, what wind blows you here? Not an ill wind, I hope? No, I haven't come for any law. That's right, ma'am. You better come for anything else. Uh, this is my nephew. Wasn't aware that you had one. That is to say, my grand nephew. Wasn't aware that you had a grand nephew. I have adopted him. And I've brought him here to put him to a school where he may be well taught and well treated. Now, tell me where that school is and all about it. The best school? Mm. At the best we have, your nephew couldn't board just now. But he could board somewhere else, I suppose. Yes, yes, I think he could. I'll tell you what you can do. What's that? Leave your nephew here for the present. Huh? He won't disturb me at all. This is a capital house for study. As quiet as a monastery, and almost as roomy. That's very kind, and all you say is true, but are you sure now that you are able come. to... come. This is the way out of the difficulty. It's only a temporary arrangement. Mm. If it don't act well, he can easily go to the right about. Uh, I'm very much obliged, and so is he, but now, I can I know what you mean. You shall not be oppressed by the receipt of favours. You may pay for him if you like, but we won't be hard about terms. Ah. Uh. That doesn't lessen the real obligation. But on that understanding, I shall be very glad to leave him. Then come and see my little housekeeper. We went up a wonderful old staircase into a shady drawing room full of flowers, where a little girl about my own age was seated at the piano. On her face was a placid and sweet expression. And there was about her an air of tranquil brightness with which ever after I was to associate Agnes Wickfield. Father. <laughs> Father. Ah, this is my little housekeeper, my daughter Agnes. My dear, this is Miss Trotwood's nephew, Trotwood Copperfield. He will attend Dr. Strong's school, and he will stay with us here for a time until other arrangements can be made. I am pleased to know you, Trotwood Copperfield. Now, Mr. Wickfield will arrange everything for you, Trot. He is my lawyer, and he will give you good advice. Be a credit to yourself, and to me, and to Mr. Dick, and heaven be with you. Thank you. Never be mean in anything. Never be false. Never be cruel. Avoid those three vices, and I can always be hopeful of you. I promise I'll try. Oh. And now, the pony's at the door, and I'm off! At first, I was startled by her abrupt departure, and felt afraid that I displeased her. But when I looked into the street, and saw how dejectedly she got into the chaise, and drove away without looking up, I understood her better. Next morning, after breakfast, I entered on school life again and was introduced to my new headmaster, Dr. Strong. He was seated in his library, a gentle, elderly scholar, with his clothes not particularly well brushed, his long black gaiters unbuttoned and his shoes yawning like two caverns on the hearthrug. He seemed to be unaware of his own déshabille until a pretty young lady seated at her embroidery in an easy chair, put down her work <laughs> and proceeded to tidy him up. Your gaiters are not fastened. Oh, dear me, you are right. Thank you, my dear, thank you. Where should I be, Wickfield, without my kind guardian to look after me? Where, indeed. This is your new pupil, Doctor. Ah. Trotwood Copperfield. Good morning, my boy. I am glad to see you. Wickfield, I will take young Trotwood to the classroom to meet his fellow students. Uh, your shoes. Oh, thank you, Annie. Come, Trotwood. 
Wickfield, will you accompany us? Of course. Good morning, Mrs Strong. Good morning, Mr Wickfield. Mrs Strong? I thought her Dr Strong's daughter. I was wondering, could she be Dr Strong's son's wife? Or could she be Mrs Dr Strong, when the doctor himself enlightened me? Uh, by the by, Wickfield, you haven't found any suitable provision for my wife's cousin yet? No, not yet. I could wish it done as soon as it can be done. Jack Malden is needy and idle. What does Dr. Watts say? Satan finds some mischief still for idle hands to do. Satan finds mischief for busy hands to do as well. The busy people do their full share of mischief in the world. No, I have not been able to dispose of Mr. Jack Malden yet. Mm -hmm. I believe I know your motive. It makes the thing more difficult. My motive is to make suitable provision for Annie's cousin. At home or abroad? Surely, one or the other. Have you no preference? No. No? Not the least. Oh. It might have simplified my task if I'd known that before. <laughs> Not the least. Dr. Strong jogged on before us, looking a little puzzled still, but smiling at me from time to time with great sweetness. Agnes was in the drawing room when I went back to Mr. Wickfield's house. How do you like your school, Trotwood? I think I like it very much. Have you ever been to school? Yes, every day, here. Papa couldn't spare me to go anywhere else. He's very fond of you, isn't he? Yes. Mama has been dead since I was born. Ah, all went well at school, eh, Trotwood? Yes, sir. You'll be happy there. Dr. Strong is one of the gentlest men I know. There may be some people who abuse his kindness. Never do that. Mr. Wickfield? Yes, what is it, Uriah? Mr. Malden begs the favour of a word. I have just this moment said goodbye to Mr. Malden. Yes, sir, but Mr. Malden has come back. I beg your pardon, pray forgive this intrusion, but as it seems I've no choice in the matter, the sooner I go abroad, the better. My cousin Annie did say she'd rather have her friends within reach than banished, and the old doctor... Doctor Strong, do you mean? <laughs> yes, of course. I call him the old doctor. It's all the same, you know. I don't know. Well, uh, Dr Strong was of the same opinion, I thought. But as it seems from the course you take with me that he's changed his mind, there's no more to be said except that the sooner I'm off, the better. When you have to plunge into the water, it's no use lingering on the bank. In your case, Mr. Malden, there'll be as little lingering as possible. Thank you. Much obliged. This was the first I saw of Mr. Jack Malden, whom, in spite of his handsome face, I thought rather a shallow sort of young gentleman. After dinner, Agnes played the piano, and Mr. Wickfield sat down to drink port, and drank a good deal. When Agnes left us, I prepared to go to bed myself, but Mr. Wickfield checked me. Oh. What would you prefer, Trotwood? Should you like to stay with us or to go elsewhere? To stay here. Are you sure? If you please. Oh, it's but a dull life we lead here, I'm afraid. Oh. No more dull for me than for Agnes, sir. Oh. Then for Agnes. This is a dull old house and a monotonous life for her. But I must have my darling near me. What would my life be here without her? <clears throat> uh, stay with us, Trotwood. Hmm? I'm glad of it. Your company for us both. I'm very glad to be here, sir. That's a fine fellow. Hmm? Well, as long as you're glad to be here, you shall stay. And Trotwood, if you wish to read, you're free to come down to my study after dinner, you know, and sit with me for company's sake, if you so wish. I thanked him for his thoughtfulness, and as he went down soon afterwards, I followed him with a book in my hand to avail myself of his permission. But seeing a light in the little round office, and guessing that it must still house Uriah Heep, who had an odd sort of fascination for me, I went in there instead. Huh? Why, Uriah, you're working late tonight. I saw your light and wondered if there was anybody here. I'm not doing office work, Master Copperfield. I'm improving my legal knowledge. I'm going through Tid's practice. 
Oh, what a writer Tid is, Master Copperfield. I suppose you're a great lawyer. Me? Master Copperfield? Oh, no. I'm a very humble person. My mother is likewise a very humble person. We live in an humble abode, Master Copperfield. My father's former calling was humble. He was a sexton. What is he now? <laughs> he is a partaker of glory at present, Master Copperfield. But we have much to be thankful for. How much have I to be thankful for in being with Mr Wickfield? Have you been with Mr Wickfield long? <laughs> I have been with him going on four years, Master Copperfield, since a year after my father's death. How much have I to be thankful for in Mr Wickfield's kind intention to give me my articles, which otherwise would not lay within the humble means of mother and self. I suppose when your articles are over, you'll be a regular lawyer. <laughs> With the blessing of Providence, Master Copperfield. Perhaps you'll be a partner in Mr Wickfield's firm one of these days, and it will be Wickfield and Heap, or Heap Late Wickfield. <laughs> oh no, Master Copperfield. I'm much too humble for that. Mr Wickfield's a most excellent man. I'm sure he is. I have not known him long, but he's an old friend of my aunt's. Your aunt is a sweet lady. A sweet lady? She has a great admiration for Miss Agnes, I believe. Yes. I hope you may have too, Master Copperfield. But I'm sure you must have. Hmm? Everybody must have. Oh, thank you, Master Copperfield, for that remark. It is so true. Humble as I am, I know it is so true. Oh, well. I must go home. Mother will be expecting me and getting uneasy. For though we're very humble, Master Copperfield, we're very much attached to each other. <laughs> now, if you come and see us any afternoon and take a cup of tea at our lowly dwelling, Mother will be as proud of your company as I should be. I'd be very glad to come. Thank you, Master Copperfield. I suppose you stop here some time? As long as I'm at school. Oh, indeed. After that, I should think you would come into the business, Master Copperfield. Oh, no. I have no such plans. But other people may plan it for you, Master Copperfield. I'm sure no one does. You'll see, Master Copperfield. You will come into the business. I should think you would, certainly. Let me shake your hand on it. You're wrong, Uriah, but we can still shake hands. Very handsome and condescending on your part, I'm sure, Master Copperfield. But, oh, what a clammy hand was his. I rubbed mine afterwards to warm it and to rub his off. In less than a fortnight, I was quite at home and happy among my new companions. I went to work very hard, and in a little while... The Murdstone and Grimby life became so strange to me that I hardly believed I had ever lived it. Every third or fourth week I went home to Dover and I saw Mr Dick every alternate Wednesday when he came by stagecoach and stayed till next morning. He would come with me into the open fields and we'd take mutual delight in flying his great kite in the quiet air till it fluttered to the ground. Oh, here it comes! <laughs> Oh, what a grand sight it is! A grand sight! It's a beautiful sight, Mr Dick. Oh, yes. Oh, yes, it's a beautiful sight. Oh. Oh, it's come down, Trottles. Yes, but you can fly it again. Fly it again? Yes. Yes, I, I can. Is there anything the matter, sir? Trotwood. Yes, Mr Dick. Your aunt is the wisest and most wonderful of women. I know. But who is the man that hides near our house and frightens her? Frightens my aunt? Yes. I thought nothing would have frightened her. The first time he came, he was... Let me see. I think you said 1649 was the year of King Charles's execution? Yes, sir. Well, I don't know how it can be. 
I, I don't think I'm as old as that. But it was soon after the mistake was made of putting some of the trouble out of King Charles's head into mine that the man came. I was walking with Miss Trotwood outside our house just after dark. And there he was. Walking about? No. No, he wasn't walking. He wasn't there at all until he came up behind her and whispered to her. And she turned round and fainted. That he should have been hiding ever since is the most extraordinary thing. And see. Oh, yes. He never came out until last night. Then he came up behind her again. Did he frighten her again? Yes. All of a shiver. Held by the railings. Cried. But Trotwood. Why did she give him money? Perhaps he was a beggar. No. No, he didn't beg. No beggar, sir. But I looked out of my window late and there he was outside the garden. And there was Miss Trotwood giving him money. Late at night. Who is he, Trotwood? I don't know, sir. I wondered about this for a little while. But then I decided that the whole thing might have been an illusion from poor Mr. Dick's troubled brain. One night, a little party was held at Dr. Strong's, partly to celebrate his birthday and partly to say goodbye to Mr. Jack Malden, who was about to leave for India as a cadet or something of the kind. Allow me, Doctor, to wish you many happy returns. Thank you, Ma. Many, many happy returns. <laughs> Not only for your own sake, but for Annie's and John Malden's and many other people's. <laughs> oh, it seems but yesterday to me, John, when you were a little creature, a head short of the Master Copperfield here, making baby love to Annie in the back garden. Oh, ah. uh, please do not mind that now, Mama. Don't be absurd, Annie. Why should you blush to hear of such things now you're an old married woman? <laughs> old? Annie, come. <laughs> no, not old by years, John. How can a girl of 20 be old by years? But as the wife of the doctor. It is well for you that your cousin is the wife of the doctor. You found a kind friend in him who will be kinder yet if you deserve it. Indeed, indeed. I've no false pride. I admit frankly that there are members of our family who want a friend. And you were one yourself before your cousin's influence raised one up for you. You are a blessing to us all, doctor. Oh. Mama, I hope you have finished. Now, Annie, my dear, it's past your cousin Jack's time and we must not detain him. Mr. Jack Walden, you have a long voyage and a strange country before you. But many men have had both, and the winds you are going to tempt have wafted thousands to fortune and brought thousands happily back. Oh, it's an affecting thing to see a fine young man going to the end of the world, leaving all he knows behind. A young man who makes such sacrifices really deserves constant support and patronage. We drink your health. Mr. Jack, farewell, a prosperous voyage out, a thriving career abroad, and a happy return home. We all drank the toast and shook hands with Mr. Malden. Then we went outside to wave him goodbye. A chaise was waiting, and I remember it rolling away and seeing Mr. Jack Malden rattle past with an agitated face and clutching something cherry-coloured in his hand. Someone noticed that Annie was not with us. We went back into the house at once and found her in a faint on the Annie. hall floor. Annie! Oh. Annie, my dear! Oh, poor oh. Annie. She's so tender-hearted. It's the parting from her old playfellow, her favourite cousin. Mother. Yes, my child. Oh, forgive me. I I'm better now. Oh, lean on me, my dear. Why, you've lost a bow from your dress. Mother. Has anyone seen a cherry-coloured ribbon? D don't trouble. It's not worth looking for. A moment ago, she had been very pale, but now she was burning red. The doctor laid her on the couch to rest, and Mr Wickfield, Agnes and I, took our departure. One morning, I met Uriah in the street, and he reminded me reproachfully of the promise I had made to take tea with himself and his mother. You haven't been to see us yet, Master Copperfield. I am sorry. You did promise, you know, but I didn't expect you to keep it. We're so very humble. You're right. I only waited to be asked. If that's all, and it really isn't our humbleness that prevents you, will you come this evening? Well... If it is our humbleness, 
I hope you won't mind owning to it, Master Copperfield, for we are well aware of our condition. If Mr Wickfield approves it, Uriah, as I'm sure he will, I'd come with pleasure. Oh, oh, Mother will be proud indeed. This is a day to be remembered, my Uriah, I'm sure. When Master Copperfield pays us a visit. <laughs> I said you'd think so, Mother. Oh, your tea, Master Copperfield. I hope you don't object to our having the door open. It's a warm day. Oh, no, Mrs. Heath. Oh, if I could have wished Father to remain among us for any reason, it would have been that he might have known this company this afternoon. Oh, oh, my Uriah has looked forward to this a long while, sir. He had his fears that our humbleness stood in the way and I joined in them myself. She did, she did. Humble we are, humble we shall always be. We know our condition and are thankful in it. I told Master Copperfield so, Mother. Oh. Mr Wickfield is an excellent gentleman, isn't he, Master Copperfield? Indeed he is. After dinner, Master Copperfield, Mr Wickfield takes port, does he not? Why, yes, he does. It is a pity he takes so much. But it's because of his sorrow, Master... Copperfield! Is it possible? Mr Micawber? My dear Copperfield, this is a most extraordinary meeting. Walking along the street, reflecting on the probability of something turning up, of which I am at present rather sanguine, I see through an opportune aperture a young but valued friend. Oh! Copperfield, my dear fellow, how'd you do? I'm very well, thank you. How are you? And how is Mrs Micawber? Thank you. She is tolerably convalescent. The twins no longer derive their sustenance from nature's founts. In short, they are weaned. She will be rejoiced to renew her acquaintance with one who has proved himself a worthy minister at the sacred altar of friendship. I should be delighted to see her again. You are very good. But forgive me. I have discovered my friend Copperfield partaking of a social meal in company with a widow lady and one who is apparently her offspring. In short, her son. Indeed. I shall esteem it an honour to be presented. Mrs Heap, mm -hmm. this is Mr Micawber, mm -hmm. an old friend. And this is Uriah Heap, Mr Micawber. The honour's all ours, sir. We are too humble, sir, my son and me, to be the friends of Master Copperfield. Oh, he's been so good as to take his tea with us, and we're thankful to him for his company, and to you, sir, for your notice. Ma'am, you're very obliging. Oh. And what are you doing, Copperfield? Still in the white? Trade? N no. I'm a pupil at Dr. Strong's school. I am extremely happy to hear it. Although a mind like my friend Copperfield's does not require that cultivation which without his knowledge of men and things it would require, still it is a rich soil teeming with latent vegetation. In short, it is an intellect capable of getting up the classics to any extent. Shall we go and see Mrs. Micawber, sir? If you will do her that favour, Copperfield, I have no scruple in saying, in the presence of our friends here, mm. that I am a man who has, for some years, contended against the pressure of pecuniary difficulties. Sometimes I have risen superior to my difficulties. Sometimes my difficulties have, in short, have floored me. Oh, no! But at no time of my life have I enjoyed a higher degree of satisfaction than in pouring my griefs into the bosom of my friend Copperfield. Mrs. Heap, good evening. Good evening, sir. Mr. Heap, your servant. At your service. Copperfield, come. My dear... 
allow me to introduce to you a pupil of Dr. Strong's. Why, Master Copperfield, what an unexpected pleasure. Did I hear a right? A pupil? Yes, Mrs. Micawber. I'm attending Dr. Strong's school. I thought you were at Plymouth. We went to Plymouth, Master Copperfield, but the local influence of my family was unavailing to obtain any employment in the Custom House for a man of Mr. Micawber's abilities. They would rather not have a man of Mr. Micawber's abilities. He would only show the deficiencies of the others. And I will not disguise from you that when the branch of my family settled in Plymouth became aware that Mr. Micawber was accompanied by myself and by little Wilkins and his sister and by the twins, they did not receive him with that ardour which he might have expected. In fact, Copperfield, our reception was cool. They became quite personal to Mr. Micawber before we'd been there a week. Only one obvious course was left. Ah, yes. To borrow of my family the money to return to London and to return at any sacrifice. Then you all came back again? We all came back again. Since then, I consulted other members of my family on the course which Mr. Micawber should take. A family of six cannot live on air. Certainly not. The opinion of those other branches of my family was that Mr. Micawber should immediately turn his attention to the coal trade. I was induced to think that there might be an opening in the Medway coal trade. So we came and saw the Medway. I say we, Master Copperfield. For I never will desert Mr. Micawber. Unfortunately, although the coal trade may require talent, it certainly requires capital. Talent Mr. Micawber has. Capital Mr. Micawber has not. We came to Canterbury, as we were so near, because Mr. Micawber was of the opinion that something might well turn up in a cathedral town. And has it? Alas, no. We are at present waiting for a remittance from London to discharge our pecuniary obligations at this hotel. Until its arrival, I am cut off from my home. I allude to our lodgings in Pentonville, from my boy and girl, and, and from my twins. Oh. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I wish I had money to give you. Oh, Copperfield, you are a true friend. But when the worst comes to the worst, no man is without a friend who is possessed of shaving materials. Emma, my love, is my razor to hand. Oh, Macabre, be calm. I beg you, be calm. <laughs> On that, Mr. Macabre became calm enough to ring for the waiter and bespeak a hot kidney pudding and a plate of shrimps for breakfast in the morning. Two days later, I dined with them and was surprised to hear that Mr. Micawber, on encountering Uriah in the street, had been taken home by him and drunk brandy and water at Mrs. Heap's. And I'll tell you what, my dear Copperfield, your friend Heap is a young fellow who might be Attorney General. My dear, help Copperfield to a little more veal. Your plate, Mr. Copperfield. If I had known that young man when my difficulties came to a crisis, I believe my creditors would have been a great deal better managed than they were. Our dinner together proved to be a thoroughly jovial occasion, with wine and strong ale, and after dinner, a bowl of hot punch prepared by Mr. Micawber's own hands. So I was not prepared to receive the following morning a communication dated a quarter of an hour after I'd left them. My dear young friend, the die is cast, all is over. Hiding the ravages of care with a sickly mask, I have not informed you that there is no hope of the remittance. I have given this hotel a note of hand, made payable fourteen days after date at my residence, Pentonville, London. When it becomes due, it will not be taken up. The result is destruction. The bolt is impending and the house must fall. This is the last communication, my dear Copperfield, you will ever receive from the beggared outcast, Wilkins Micawber. 
I was so shocked by this heart-rending letter that I ran directly to the little hotel. But halfway there, I caught sight of the London coach, with Mr. and Mrs. Micawber up behind. Mr. Micawber, the very picture of tranquil enjoyment, eating walnuts out of a paper bag with a bottle sticking out of his pocket. A walnut, my love. No, thank you, Micawber, dear. Ah, pleasant day. A very pleasant day indeed. Take heart, my Emma. Tomorrow to fresh fields and pastures new. <laughs> mm -hmm.